It's good to see everyone this morning. I hope everybody is doing well. Terry gave me a device so he could hear a little better. Terry, did I turn it on? New technology, man. All right. We good? You good? <laughs> good to see everyone this morning. They're in the scripture reading. In Luke, the Gospel of Luke, you might be turning, might be turning back over there. As we read about Jesus going steadfastly towards Jerusalem. And there in the Gospel of Luke, there in Luke 9, the, the time had come. And I think it's just, you, you know, as it's phrased, as, as Brother Atkins was reading the scripture reading a moment ago, as, as it was phrased, it's just, I think it's interesting because it's, now it came to pass, as Luke 9, 51, now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up, I think New American Standard, for him to ascend, or for the ascension to happen. I think it's interesting that it, it goes there instead of the cross. It's not now the time had come for him to go to the cross. It's now the time had come for him to ascend. Now, we understand we're not going to get to the ascension without first going through the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus, certainly. But just to phrase it this way, I think it's just an interesting thing that all along, he, you know, as Jesus would talk to the disciples and he would tell them that he was going to be betrayed and that he was going to die, then he says, but on the third day I'm going to be raised up. And they always focus on the dying part. <laughs> Peter says, no, it's not going to happen like that. They always focus on, on his death. And his focus is on, yes, he, he's going to Jerusalem to die, but he knows what's coming after that with the resurrection and with the ascension itself to sit down at the right hand of God. Regardless, the time had come. Messengers would be sent ahead, preparing the way. And you have the Samaritan village that didn't receive them. And the Samaritans, they gave their reasoning for not receiving him. There in verse 52, right? It says that to prepare for him, verse 53, but they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. I wonder if there is not more to this than just a flat-out rejection, right? It's not just, and they, they did not receive him, it's they did not receive him because his face was set for Jerusalem. Because when you look through the Gospels, in any time Jesus had any sort of dealings with the Samaritans, like John chapter 4, the woman at the well, and she goes and she tells the people in town, right, this is the Messiah. He actually stayed with them for a couple of days. They were very receptive, right? They were very receptive of Jesus. Those Samaritans, other places, you see, you see as he dealt with the Samaritans, and it, it wasn't usually a, a negative context. So I wonder if there's not more to this, the Samaritans did not receive him than just a flat-out rejection. They did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. And anyway, you can, you can think on that one a little bit if you want to. But what I would like to do this morning is I would look, like to look more closely at the Apostle John. As John says what he says, when the disciples James and John saw this, they said, and I'm just focusing on John today, but James and John together said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? Who is John? Right, the Apostle John, the, the, the disciple whom Jesus loved, okay? You come up to 1 John, and you type in the word love into a concordance, right? Anymore, it's not even turning to in a concordance. Type it in. You know how many times the word love shows up in 1 John? It's more than 20, right? This is the apostle that's all about love. This is the disciple whom Jesus loved. Well, that's, that's who he is. But when we first meet him, you know, James and John were the ones that Jesus gave the nickname of Sons of Thunder. Now, why do you think Jesus gave them those nicknames, Sons of Thunder? Do you think it, it somehow was ironic or it sort of stood in, you know, was it the opposite? You know, sometimes people will call me tiny. Why do people call me tiny? <laughs> I can't figure it out. <laughs> you think... Do you think, why do you think Jesus gave them the name Sons of Thunder? 
you might consider it. Well, here's my question. As we see John, in 1 John, it's all about love, right? It's all about love and grace and mercy. The Lord's loving graciousness. That is the same individual here who, when the Samaritans don't receive Jesus because his face is set towards Jerusalem, it's the Apostle John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, saying, burn them. Burn them all. And the question is, how do we get from a scorched earth mentality? How do we get from the apostles James and John being the storm, right? Sons of thunder. How do we go from being the storm and scorched earth to love? How do we get from A to Jesus? <laughs> how do we get there? And that's, that's what I wanted to talk about this morning. And I'll simply say this, people change. We all should change. I, I, feel, I feel pity, I feel sorry for an individual who, as we reflect on our lives and they, and they say, well, I'm really not much different than I was 10 years ago. Because you know what that means? That means they haven't grown. They haven't changed. And I, I'll ask you this, have you changed from a year ago? From two years ago? Just, just think back about all the things five years ago, 20 years ago. Y'all remember when you were teenagers? <laughs> you may try to block that out of your memory. I remember when I was a teenager. People change. I, I would suggest that John changed. And as we think about his attitude towards others, I think his attitude towards others changed. And I think that's what Jesus is wanting him to do when he says, you don't know what kind of spirit you are of. I did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another city. But I'd like to look at the account. I'd like to think about what leads to the change that the Lord desires in us. What helped John to love, to love others? One thing is very simple frankly, and it's Jesus died for them. <laughs> the fact that if we can truly appreciate and apply the concept that Jesus died for them, if we understand that and apply that, then that changes us. He's going, right? I understand it's talk, it, right? The ascension, the time has come for him to be received up. But again, he's going to Jerusalem for a reason. Look over in chapter 13. Over in chapter 13, at verse 33, where we have this verse. Chapter 13, verse 33, where he very much points towards the cross, says, Nevertheless, I must journey today, tomorrow, and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish outside of Jerusalem. He's going to Jerusalem to die. I know, he knows what's on the other side of the cross, but he's going to Jerusalem to die. The Samaritans did not understand that. That when he's going to Jerusalem to die, that he's dying for the world. <laughs> They didn't understand that. The Samaritans did not understand. His face is set towards Jerusalem for a reason. He's going to die for the world. The Samaritans didn't understand that. And I don't think John the Apostle understood that at this point. I don't know of anybody who really fully understood that other than Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit. So I'm not sure if John did understand it, but I think John was going to understand it. Some things are only understood, right? Hindsight is 2020, looking backwards. And John was in a, a unique position because here he's looking forward to the cross. After the cross, he's looking backwards. And some things you just don't understand until it actually happens. It's going to be the Apostle John, who in 1 John chapter 2, says, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but also the whole world. Do you think he understood that at this point when he says, burn them? He didn't understand it. Jesus was going to die for them. And as Jesus dies for people, as Jesus dies for the world, it changes us. It is an amazing contrast. John wanted to kill them. Jesus wanted to die for them. That's the contrast. And it is an amazing thing. 
the love that the Lord has for those that we would despise. For those that we would hate, the Lord loves. That is an amazing thing. There is so much hatred in the world. And the Lord loves. He stands in absolute contrast. So different. So different. So different than even in that day and age, the relationship that the Jews had with the Samaritans. Right? <laughs> the disciples go off in John chapter 4. They have gone into town to buy, to buy bread. And they come back and they find Jesus talking to who? Talking to A, a Samaritan, B, a woman? Really? <laughs> and then he says, I have food that you don't know about. And they say, who brought him food? <laughs> and he says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. You know, that's actually before this account in Luke 9. So one of those who came back would have been the Apostle John. You might consider that. But we know the relationship that the Jews had with the Samaritans. When we truly follow Jesus, when we truly follow him and learn from him, our hatred will turn to love, and it changes us. When we truly apply the concept of loving our enemies as our Heavenly Father does, right? Our Heavenly Father who loves them sends the rain on the just and the unjust. That if we love our enemies, we will be perfect as our Heavenly Father in heaven is perfect is what Jesus says. Jesus died for them. That very fact changes us. A lot of times we're like, to use another apostle, we're like Peter. Remember what Peter does in the garden other than sleeping? <laughs> After he wakes up and as Judas leads the, the contingent of people to Jesus, right? What, what lesson does Peter have to learn at that point? When Jesus says, put it away, he jerks that sword out. Now is there a time to have the sword out, apparently, because Jesus says, right, you need to take a sword. That's, that's for another lesson, though, okay? But at that point, it was not time to jerk that sword out, and Jesus says, put it away. So as an application, we'll, we'll put it this way. We have to learn to holster our anger. There is a time to be angry, but the verse says, be angry and do not sin. And we have to learn to holster our anger. Think about Jesus. When Jesus was healing a man on the Sabbath in the synagogue, I believe it was in the synagogue, and he asks, he asks those around him, he says, is it right to do good on the Sabbath? And they don't answer. You remember what it says? It says, Jesus looked around in anger, grieved at the hardness of their hearts. Do we have to temper our anger with grief? Without grief, what happens to anger? Right? Without being grieved for sin. And we're simply saying this, there's a time to be angry, but a lot of times, a lot of times, the, the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. And we'll come back to this point, a lot of times righteous indignation is just indignation. And it's just, we're just angry. We're just angry. In my notes, I also put it like this. We all get frustrated from time to time because people don't do what we think they should do. And we all get frustrated. But sometimes it's like the phrase that is used with nuclear, with nuclear war. Those of you who grew up um, or lived through the 1950s and 60s, right? Under the, in that time as you have the Cuban Missile Crisis and you have the Cold War and you have all sorts of things as you have nuclear weapons proliferation. And the phrase was coined, mutually assured destruction. What was mutually assured destruction? We're going to kill you. And then the other party says, no, we're going to kill you. <laughs> and you end up killing each other. Galatians talks about that. Leave a marker here in Luke chapter 9. But in Galatians chapter 5, it talks about that exact thing. In Galatians chapter 5, you have the warning that is given. Galatians 5 at verse... 15, but if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. Right? Mutually assured destruction. We know what it looks like on a national level, on a country level, 
I remember what it looked like to a teenage boy in ninth grade. And I can't even remember the kid's name. Here, I'll put it this way. I had a friend in the ninth grade. You know what that usually means? It's about me, but anyway. And I can't even remember what led to it, but I remember I took a swing at a kid in the ninth grade. Popped him right on the jaw. It was great. You know what he did? He punched me back in my jaw. So then in the next period's English class, both me and him are sitting there doing this number. Ah. <laughs> wow, you really, that, that really worked out well for you, didn't it? So now you're both hurting. Right? Now you're both consumed. Now you're both consumed. What we have to do is we have to learn to overcome evil with good. Right? Vengeance belongs to the Lord. It's too heavy a burden for us, for us to bear. We overcome evil with good, and we recognize Jesus died for them. He died for them. John says, you want us to kill him. Jesus says, you don't know what spirit you're of. The fact that Jesus died for them, when we fully appreciate that and recognize that, it changes us. And it changes us as we move past hatred to love. I would also suggest helping them to change changes us, being instrumental in their change. Again, it's no secret how the Jews felt about the Samaritans and vice versa. Within two chapters of Luke 9, right, Luke 9 is where this happens. And with the very next chapter in Luke chapter 10, it's the parable of the Good Samaritan. Within one chapter of this happening, it's the parable of the Good Samaritan. Verse 25, chapter 10. Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? Love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, strength, with all your mind, your neighbor as yourself. He said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this, you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And then you have the parable of the Good Samaritan. Within one chapter of the Apostle John saying, Do you want us to burn him out? You have the parable of the Good Samaritan. Do you think that's a coincidence? Within one chapter? Really? We know, we know what the point is of the Good Samaritan. Verse 36, So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? Verse, 20, verse 37, He who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. A spirit of mercy. Who do you think Jesus was trying to reach with that lesson? Do you think it was only the lawyer who asked the question? Or do you think his own disciples needed to hear this lesson as well about the Samaritan? Do you think the apostle John needed to hear this parable? Right? We know how they thought about the Samaritans. Within one chapter of, John, of James and John saying, kill him. And you have the parable given. Jesus saying, you don't know what kind of spirit you're of. Just an amazing, an amazing account. The gospel is going to go out, right? Come over to the book of Acts. The gospel is going to go out beginning in Jerusalem. It was prophesied to happen that way. We've studied about that recently. In Acts chapter 1 at verse 8, you have how it's going to go out. Acts 1 verse 8, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and to the end of the earth. I wonder if they understood that at that point. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> He's not speaking metaphorically, saying it's going to go out. Okay, so it's, okay, it's going to go out from Jerusalem to, okay, all Judea, and Samaria, okay. Now what's that going to look like? Well, look over a little bit. Look over in chapter 8. Okay, you just go through it. Okay, Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 3, the lame man healed. Chapter 4, Peter and John arrested. All right, but we're still in Jerusalem. Chapter 5, you have Ananias and Sapphira. Chapter 6, the Grecian widows. Okay, chapter, chapter 7 is Stephen's sermon. And how that ends is with Stephen being stoned. And now you have chapter 8, verse 1. Now Saul was consenting to his death. At that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Oh, that's how it's going to happen. That's how we're going to fulfill Acts 1 at verse 8. The gospel's going to start in Jerusalem, and then it's going to go out. How's it going to go out? It's going to be under persecution. 
Okay. Verse 4 of chapter 8. Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word, and then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. Oh. All right, now we're, now we're, man, it's really going to the Samaritans. It's really going there. And all of a sudden it's the account of Philip and it's the account of Simon the sorcerer. And as Simon the sorcerer obeys the gospel, verse 13, believing and being baptized, then you have verse 14, now when the apostles who are at Jerusalem, because Philip wasn't an apostle, now when the apostles who are at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. Huh. Who when they had come down prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, Your money perish with you, because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. We always read that account. I always read that account, and I always have one or two big takeaways, and I've missed something for 44 years. Just had a birthday. Couldn't remember how old I was. We make the point, why, did, why was Peter the one to deal with Cornelius? <laughs> we, we were talking, me and I think I've shared this conversation. Brace and I were having this conversation about different apostles being chosen for different works. And it's like, which apostle would you think, you know, Paul is going to be sent to the Gentiles by the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit separate to me Barnabas and Paul for the work which I have for them. And they're going to be sent to the Gentiles. But they didn't go to the first one. They weren't the one. Paul wasn't the one who went to Cornelius. It was Peter. Why do you think the Lord in his wisdom chose Peter? If we can, if Peter can change with his view about the Gentiles, if Peter can change, and surely anybody can change. Right? We know Peter's feelings about the Gentiles. And then Paul, why was Paul chosen to go to the Gentiles? He was in a unique position. Right? Because he wasn't born in Israel. He's Saul of Tarsus. He has a Roman citizenship. He was taught at the feet of Gamaliel. All these things you would think, well, oh, Paul went to the Jews and Peter to the... No, <laughs> no, it's always just the opposite. But, but we'll do that exercise with Paul and Peter, and I've completely missed one. Verse 24, And then Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me that none of the things which you have spoken may come upon me. And so when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Who did? Peter and John. John, John, John. Hey, John, you know some of those people who you're preaching to at this point, some of those may be some of the same people who you said kill them back in Luke 9. <laughs> and what's the answer? Yeah, I know, but things change. Yeah, I know, but I've changed. Jesus died for them. And now, who is it who's being instrumental in the change in the Samaritans? It's John. It's Peter and John preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. As we think about that figure, that picture, does teaching others change us? Who always gets the most out of class? It's the teacher. Does loving others change us? Does trying to help others actually in turn help us? It's the weirdest thing <laughs> that as we give to others, who is it who's richly blessed? We are. <laughs> as we help others to change, it changes us. And who is the Lord going to use to be an instrument of change with the Samaritans? It's John. John, don't kill them, 
back in Luke 9, don't kill them, change them. The time had not come for the Samaritans yet in Luke chapter 9, but the time was going to come, and it's going to be John who is used for it as the Lord is going to save them. Don't kill them, save them. Helping them, helping others changes us. If we're just consumed with the wrath of man, we won't help them. But if we force ourselves, and sometimes that's what you got to do. <laughs> you have to force yourself. It actually, in turn, changes us. And then the third point I wanted to make is the idea of not focusing on ourselves. And that's one reason that I asked Andrew to change that song before the sermon. None of self and all of thee. Here, the account back in Luke 9. Come back to Luke 9. The account directly preceding this account, when John says, you want us to smite them off the face of the earth? The account directly preceding this is verse 49 and verse 50. Now John answered and said, Master, we saw someone casting out... Right? This is John speaking. John answered and said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him because he does not follow with us. But Jesus said to him, Do not forbid him, for he who is not against us is on our side. We, we've spoken about this a couple months ago. We are not far removed from the transfiguration. <laughs> that's, that's just back in verse 27 down through verse 36. That means we're not far removed from when the disciples, not counting Peter, James, and John, could not cast out that demon when the father brings his son. Okay, and we made the point, really? So nine of you couldn't cast this demon out earlier, and now John's saying, oh, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him. Really? Interesting. Interesting. And the Lord says, don't forbid him. He who is not against us. You know, in the Old Testament, it's amazing how many parallels there are between the Old and the New Testament. It is amazing. There's an account in the Old Testament where you have <laughs> all of a sudden two prophets are prophesying. And I believe it's Joshua, if I remember correctly, who sees it. And he comes to Moses, and Joshua says, Oh, there's two guys out there prophesying. Do you want me to tell them to knock it off? And Moses says, Are you really zealous for my sake? Or is this because you don't understand what's going on? And he says, Oh, that everybody would prophesy by the Lord. Here, you see someone casting out demons, and you're going to tell them to knock it off? If someone's able to cast out demons, who gave them the authority to cast out the demons? Uh... <laughs> John, there's things happening that you don't know about that are not dreamed of in your philosophy, frankly. But here earlier, verse 46, then a dispute arose among them about which of them would be the greatest. You don't say. Huh. You don't say. You know, in the parallel accounts, because that business about disputing over who's the greatest, that happens more than once. And in the parallel accounts, it makes you wonder, but in one of the accounts, and it, it may have, this may be Luke's version of it, but it may not. But in one of the parallel accounts, it's when James and John's mother comes to Jesus and she says, my sons want to sit one on your left, one on your left and one on your right. Right? Can they do that? And Jesus says, are you able to, are you able to, you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink? You able to be baptized? And they say, we're able. And he says, <laughs> okay. But then he says, but on my right and left, it is for those whom it has been prepared. And I never thought about that before. James and John, and again, y'all should, should sit in on some of me and Brace's discussions where we talk about weird stuff like this. Okay. Because Jesus doesn't say, nobody gets to sit on my left and right. He says, it's for those whom it's been prepared. Well, James and John are pretty high up, right? This is Peter, James, and John. Maybe they could sit in a triangle around them, <laughs> right? We want to sit one on your left and one on your right, James and John. It's for those for whom it's been prepared. And it says, and the others, when they heard this, they were greatly displeased. They were greatly displeased with James and John. You don't say. 
The other ten, because when they, as this argument keeps happening about who's the greatest, if you're going to argue who's the greatest, you're going to have to argue who's the least greatest. <laughs> now, who are you going to put at the, you're figuring out the pecking order. But I want you to back up and look at the forest. Can you imagine the audacity of within however much time has passed, and I don't know exactly how much time has passed, page-wise, it's on the same page. Can you imagine the audacity of seeing and meeting Moses and Elijah and then having the gall to say, we want the seats of honor at the table? Really? <laughs> the audacity of some people. Not Moses, not Elijah, the fishermen from Galilee. <laughs> really? When Jesus says, it is for those for whom it's been prepared. Whoever that is. I don't know if it's Moses and Elijah or anybody else. My point is just the audacity to argue about who is the greatest. Who is the greatest? It is James and John looking for the preeminence as it is. I want you to read the end of the Gospel of John. I want you to see how things change and why I asked for that song to be led. Come over to John chapter 21. To go from, we forbade him because he does not follow us. <laughs> we want to sit on your left and right hand. We want the places of honor. Who is the greatest in the kingdom? And now see how, see how the, the song has changed. The end of John 21, 24. This is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Where has the focus shifted to? Come over to 1 John. As we think about, we're thinking about people changing. And as we think about not focusing on ourselves and how it changes us. To go from, it's about me, it's about my place, it's about me being, right, whatever the case may be. This is 1 John 1 at verse 1. This is the same individual who once, who, who, who his mother came looking for the place of honor. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. Where has the focus shifted? Right? All of a sudden, on this side of the cross, it's not about me. It's about him. It's not about he. It's not about me. It's about others. Not focusing on ourselves changes us. To use a, a phrase that John the Baptist used, he must increase and I must decrease. And as we decrease and he increases until eventually it's the song, none of self and all of thee. And we're changed. <laughs> it changes us. Not focusing on ourselves changes us. As we love the Lord, and now we're back to the royal command. As we love the Lord and as we love others, we are changed. John's spirit, John's spirit would change. The cross will do that. Humility will do that. Endeavoring to be a part of change in others will do that. And what can happen as we think about what John asked for back in Luke 9? What will happen is hellfire and apathy, right? Hellfire and not caring. Hellfire and apathy can actually change and we become caring and loving. That's, that's the change that happens. People change. I think John changed. 
I think the Corinthians changed. Not, I was thinking about this before I got up here. Pardon this tangent. Pardon this tangent. I want you to come to Revelation. I want you to see something. I was thinking about this last night, and I have to say it now because I'm going to forget it by this Wednesday. Pardon me. Come over to Revelation. Look from chapters 2 and on. Chapter 2 and verse 3. The seven churches of Asia, right? You have the church in Ephesus. You have the church in Smyrna, on and on and on. You have the seven churches of Asia, okay? Let me ask you a question. If your Bible has each church has a heading for it, that'll probably help out a little bit. The first one is Ephesus. If, if I asked a question just quickly, is there a single congregation in all of Scripture that you could describe as having a love problem, dealing with persecution, compromising on doctrine and sexual immorality? Within this congregation, there were those who were dead and there were those who were dying. Even in this congregation, though, there were, there were a few who were faithful, and in this congregation, they were really puffed up for the most part. Now, what congregation did I just describe? <laughs> the Corinthians shared all of those traits from those seven churches. Now, I want you to come to 2 Corinthians. Come to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And I'll ask it this way. How many problems did the church in Corinth have? <laughs> you want to put a number on it? Chuck just, Chuck just gave it the old raised eyebrow treatment. How many problems did the church in Corinth have? And they had a lot, right? Undoubtedly, they had, they had a lot. Tell me a congregation who would not love to hear the following. Thus saith the Lord, Verse 11, for observe this very thing that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you, what clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication in all things you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. What changed? The Corinthians changed. I understand there is still work to do, but name... For all the problems the church in Corinth had as we've been going through 1 Corinthians, one of the wonderful things about the Corinthians is they took Paul's rebuke and they applied it. And at least in some realms, they changed. And that's this verse. Name a congregation that would not love to hear the Lord saying, what clearing of yourselves, in all things you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. People can change. Back in Luke 9 now. Come back to Luke 9, and pardon me for that tangent. People can change. We can change. The Apostle John could change. And please look at verse 54 as I say this. Even Elijah could change. And now we get to talk about Elijah. Elijah. Do you want us to call down fire? Do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them just as Elijah did? Did Elijah have to learn to listen to the Lord? When I phrase the question that way, how do you answer it? Did Elijah have to learn to listen to the Lord? Yes, right? In the cave, right? When he's running from Jezebel, right? And he had to learn to listen to the Lord? He had to learn to listen to the Lord, but that's not the account being referenced. Do you want us to call down fire like Elijah did? What did Elijah do? We'll read it here in a moment. What did Elijah do? Oh, well, he called down fire on the Samaritans, right? Yes, he did. <laughs> but sort of like, who was it, Paul Harvey? That's only half of the story. But Elijah called down fire. That's, what, that's how John remembers it. Okay, let's come back and read it. 2 Kings, come back to 2 Kings. Leave a marker here in Luke 9, but come back to the Old Testament because I have a feeling John is not remembering the whole thing. Back in 2 Kings chapter 1. 2 Kings 1, verse 1, Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. 
Now Ahaziah fell through the lattice of his upper room, and Samarian was injured, right? Samarian, he was injured. So he sent messengers and said to them, Go inquire of Baalzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover from this injury. And the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, the Tishbite, Arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say to them, Is it because there is no god in Israel that you are going to inquire of Baalzebub, the god of, the god of Ekron? Ekron, now therefore thus says the Lord, you shall not come down from the bed which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. So Elijah departed, and when the messengers returned to him, he said to them, why have you come back, the king? So they said to him, a man came up to meet us and said to us, go return to the king who sent you and say to him, thus says the Lord, is it because there is no God in Israel that you are sending to inquire Beelzebub, the God of Ekron, therefore you shall not come down from the bed which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. And then he said to them, what kind of man was it who came up to, who, what, pardon me, what kind of man was it who came up to meet you and told you these words? So they answered him, a hairy man wearing a leather belt around his waist, and he said, oh, it's Elijah the Tishbite. Again? Right? He kind of was a thorn in the flesh of my father Ahab. <laughs> right? Oh, you troubler of Israel. And now his son says, oh, <laughs> he sends far off, go to this, go to Beelzebub, right? And inquire about whether or not I'm going to survive this injury. The messengers come back in a lot less time than he thought. And really, is there no God in Israel that you feel like you got to go far away? Hmm, Okay. Great, now Elijah, okay, verse 9. So the king sent to him, Elijah, a captain of 50 with his 50 men. So he went up to him, and there he was sitting on the top of a hill. He's not hiding in a cave at this point, is he? No, <laughs> he's, not, he's not even sitting at the bottom of a hill. He's sitting at the top of a hill. And this fellow, Ahab's son, Ahaziah, puts out a warrant for his arrest. So he sends the captain with 50 men, Okay, go find Elijah, and there he is. He's on top of the hill. All right, <laughs> let's see how this plays out. So they come to Elijah sitting on top of the hill, and he spoke to him. The captain did. Man of God, the king has said, come down. And so Elijah answered and said to the captain of 50, If I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. And fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. Well, this is not going well at all. Right? Verse 11. Then he, that would be the king, sent to him another captain of 50 with his 50 men. How do you think that's going to go? <laughs> Talk about beating a dead horse. And he answered and said to a man of God, thus, sa thus has the king said, come down quickly. And so Elijah answered and said to them, if I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50 men. Great. So now we're up to 102 dead people there. <sighs> How much do you think the Jews love that part? Kill them. <laughs> Just keep killing them. Smite them. Lord, do you want us to call down fire like Elijah did and consume them? I wonder what part of the story John remembered. What do you think the king's going to do? We've gone through two rounds. Some people always make the wrong decision. Sends the first group, dead as a doornail. Sends the second group, dead as a doornail. What do you think the king's going to do? Oh, well, okay, I guess I won't send any more. Nope. <laughs> let's send another, let's send more. Okay. Verse 13, again, he sent a third captain of the 50 with his 50 men, and the third captain of the 50 went up, and we'll pause right there. Now, how do you think the story's going to play out? <laughs> what part of the story do you think John remembered? the third captain with his 50. Let's see what he says. And the third captain of 50 went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah and pleaded with him and said to a man of God, please let my life and the life of these 50 servants of yours be precious in your sight. Look, fire has come down from heaven and burned up the first two captains of 50s with their 50s, but let my life now be precious in your sight. And the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, 
go down with him. So is the account about fire from heaven or is the account about mercy? Kind of depends on which part you're focusing on, doesn't it? Which part do you think John was focused? Which part was John focusing on? Burn him. Mm. The whole account is actually about Ahaziah and what was going to happen. But it's amazing. The next chapter is Elijah ascending to heaven. Man, we're back to parallels again. Oh, we're, we're going to talk about Elijah's ascension. The time has come. Dealing with the Samaritans. Amazing the parallels. Is there a time for fire as you come back to Luke? Is there a time for fire? Certainly. Is there a time to go easy? Is there a time for mercy? Is there a time to recognize the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives but to save them? Come back to Luke 9. Because we go from Luke 9, we go from Luke 9. Do you want, do you want us to call down fire like Elijah did? Okay. You don't know what kind of spirit you're of. Do you remember what home base was for the apostles? Where they spent a lot of their time? Anybody remember what the city was? Capernaum. Oh boy. Capernaum was home. You got no problem wanting to burn that Samaritan village to the ground, do you, John? Okay. The 70 are sent out in chapter 10. Messengers are sent. The 70 are sent out. Verse 13. We've gone from John saying, do you want me to burn this Samaritan village? James and John, do you want us to burn this Samaritan village? You don't know what kind of spirit you're of. The Son of Man didn't come to destroy men's lives but to save them. But then verse 13. Woe to you, Chorazin, and woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the, judgments, at the judgment than for you. Now what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? Did he get burned off the face of the map? Yep. Verse 15, And you, Capernaum. Where did, what did they call home? <laughs> they, were, they were from right there in that neck of the woods. That's where Capernaum was. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. He who hears you <clears throat> hears me. He who rejects you rejects me. And he who rejects me rejects him who sent me. Is there a time for fire? Is there a time for mercy? And I understand there's a transitional time here right now. It wasn't time for the gospel to go to the Samaritans. Okay? So the Lord says, so when John says, you want us to call down fire? You don't know what spirit you're of. But let's talk about Capernaum. And let's talk about Bethsaida. And what's the Lord say? It'll be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than for these cities. Do you think the Apostle John would have been willing to call down fire on Capernaum? Probably not. Which one had been more receptive to the Lord? I understand they reject him here, but again, I think there's a reason. You might consider it. You might consider it. What are we called to do? We're called to change. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. But we are called to change. And John changed. As Jesus died for them, and as John became instrumental in their change, and as John denied himself. And he puts the focus squarely where it should be. On the Lord and on others. And if that's not where your focus is, then you need to refocus. If you're not denying yourself, you need to refocus. If you're not putting your brethren first, right? Do good unto all, especially to those of the household of faith. If your focus is not on your brethren especially, as well as others, then you need to refocus. Your love is not what it should be. Your love is not what it should be. John had to change. We all have to change. We all have to grow. 
And thankfully, the Lord is patient, and the Lord helps us, and we learn from him. Even Elijah changed. That last fella, what did he plead for? He pled for mercy. Mm. As we offer the invitation, what is it? Give me thy heart. The man comes to Elijah. I don't know if those 102 others who were killed, I don't know if they were completely consumed or if there were 102 dead bodies around. I don't know. But he knew they were dead. How much would you like to come to Elijah as the third guy? How much would you like to come? Would you see it as a death sentence? Oh, that king. Can you imagine the third guy when the king says, go and bring him? <laughs> Are you kidding me? I'm dead. I'm a walking dead man. And he comes to Elijah. He comes to the man of God. And he says, please have mercy on me. And the Lord says, effectively, mercy it is. And he was spared. He was spared. The lesson is yours. If you're here this morning, if you're not a Christian, as we've been talking about change, there's a reason that we're about to sing, Give Me Thy Heart. It's because the Lord requires us to change. He requires us to repent and to bear fruits worthy of repentance. And the foundation of our faith is Christ and Him crucified. That's the foundation. And as we truly learn that and appreciate that and apply that, we change. And that change begins when we become Christians. And we're like that guy who came to Elijah. We know what we deserve. <laughs> we know what we deserve. And he comes and he says, mercy. The lesson is yours. If you're here this morning, you need to respond in putting on Christ in baptism as the old man is buried, done away, and we can arise to walk in newness of life. Grace and mercy coming through Jesus Christ. The lesson is yours. If you're here and need to respond, please come while we stand and while we sing.